that's very, very easy to take a round um, heating element and draw it around a thing and then make a prototype. Um, producing a thousand of those a day and building the machinery to produce a thousand of those a day, that is a different problem entirely. Um, and that is what we've been solving over the last couple of years. So manufacturing, yeah. um, you, you've cut down all that extra manufacturing steps. Yeah, because everything on the Revo is lathe work now, right? Everything is lathe work. You're not doing any flats. It's all lathe work. So All day long. So and so for people at home that aren't familiar with like production machining and the differences between them, um, when, when, when you're um, looking at a heater block, you take a slab of metal, you put it in a machine that has um, a motion system, probably not dissimilar to your 3D printer. Instead of a nozzle, you've got a melon cutter. And then you come along and you blat away a bunch of material. But then you have to do some flips and you have to have maybe a special vise that you've already pre-cut, like we call them soft drawers to hold the thing. And like you have to go through. And if you look at a heater block, it's got holes coming out of all the sides and you've got to go through it. Years ago, I actually machined a V6 block out of, um, I think I used Amco. It was something we use in molding at work. It's like a, it's like a brass yeah, aluminum yeah. or a brass copper alloy. So I machined one of them on a bridge port yeah. on my own. And just making one, yes, on a bridge port, hey, man, yes. it was still like <laughs> hour, hour and a half because you have to hold, figure out how you're holding stuff and then you've got to set up and then you got to cut the slots for clamp which I just gave it to the guy on the wire oh. ADM to do for me, but. Yeah, uh, and like that, that that will not do at the, like when we're into making thousands per day, which is what we've been building the production line to support. Um, and so when you have a lathe and a turned part, you have something called a bar feeder. And a bar feeder is kind of like the magazine in a gun and that you have tons of bars all stacked up like this. And the one at the bottom is being fed into the machine, the chuck kind of from the back, right? And so it's being fed out and you put out just enough to make one uh, revert mandrel and you come along and this is spinning. And so you come along with your tools and you do all your stuff and drill some holes from the end. And then actually what we do is we have a second chuck over here it gets cut off and so now you've got your little piece over here you come and do some backside chamfering all of this is fully automated so you've got something like nine axes but it's no human interaction there's no flips to do because the machine is just handing off the parts and doing its stuff all day you've got two heads working in tandem running in parallel and these little parts then get dropped off onto a conveyor belt that just drops them there and feeds them to the end, and then they go into a part washing process um, to remove the oil that's being sprayed around everywhere. This is a huge deal. This is a really, really big deal because a heater block is actually like the most expensive um, part of the hot side, I think. Um, Which most people don't realize. Point. It's just a block of copper or aluminum with a few holes in it. Whoop de doo. But when you think I, about how it takes to make like, that, it's the dumbest part. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like it. It's, it's, really, it's like a, it's my fault. Um, but I, <laughs> well, you didn't know what the, six, seven years ago when you guys were designing that thing. Right? Well, I originally when I was designing it, it was designed around um, a piece of standard uh, extruded grade aluminium that you can get, which is sixteen by twenty or something. Um, and it, the intention was that you would saw off a chunk and do the things and kind of, kind of bar for you a bit. That never actually came to pass, and we ended up machining them out of billet because that's the way you do things. Um, and all the wasted yeah. material, too. Yeah. So this is dramatically more efficient. It's more accurate. Um, we can set the machine running these and then turn off the lights and go home for the weekend, and it's just got a stack of... These bars are three meters long. So if you think about a three-meter long bar and how many... Little Revo heaters, yeah. you can fit in that, even with the waste and all the rest of it. And then you've got like 10 of them stacked high. Um, that's cool. That's yeah, really cool. Lights out machining is awesome if, once you get it set up. Yeah. And I mean, the machine that makes these, we use the same thing as you use to make Swiss watches, um, or Japanese watches, technically. Um, it's a Japanese brand of lift. Um, and I kid you not, when it's making these things, it's quieter than most 3D printers. 
despite the fact that like there's carbide being shoved into spinning metal at like five thousand and ripples, you're getting yeah, it just sits there and sings. It's a it's a thing of beauty. Um, Swiss machining, there's basically just high pressure oil everywhere. Like every single one of the tools has through coolant and like tiny micro channels basically that are blasting. I think it's like somewhere in the order of like 50 to 100 bar oil um, being blasted at the point where the cutting is happening to lubricate, cool, and blast away the chips. And all the drills have, you know, the same channels going through them that blast out all the chips. There's oil everywhere, just like yeah. tons of These machines of are enclosed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you even have to have what's called mist extraction to because you go in really fast with a high speed drill or something and you you generate mist and that mist will you kind of creep out of the machine and don't breathe this and also you don't want oil all over the floor so you have big extractors um, like we don't peck like no 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 pecking is for amateurs like when we go in with the drill like you, like if you've got two hundred bar oil. The chips are coming out, yep. right? And you just like stub drill straight in, one and done. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one that blows my mind the most is when, when we start the the first cut on a Revo heater is to turn it into this kind of top hat shape with the. Um, so what you've got is this kind of top hat shape thing, and then you put the heater ring around that. So it's like the ring is sitting on the brim of the heat of the of the top hat encompassing the cylindrical upright bit um and when the tool comes in it basically does that entire pass in a one and done like it's kind of like three four millimeters deep and it's just like gone yeah um and and this is all in-house too right like everything for this new heater this is all in-house yeah from from the bar um the actual heating element printing and centering process that is not done in house um that's that is subcon um but everything after that including the the machining at the moment um we're machining them all in house right now um, so um, at re at launch you're going to have the revo micro and the revo 6 so but a lot of people want like rigid mounting you've you've hinted that you're working on other heat sink designs um, are you able to say what will be available for release or after release, or is that still under? And will I'm assuming because you're gonna the whole cold side's open source. So if you don't put out yeah. a Ender three compatible heatsink, I'm sure one will be on AliExpress in a month. So <laughs> we, we'd be stupid if we didn't release heatsinks for popular printers, right? That would be a really dumb move. Um, <laughs> Like, that would just make no business sense whatsoever. Like, oh, here's the most popular 3D printer in the world. Would you like people with that 3D printer to buy your product? No, says E3D. <laughs> uh, I, I, I figured I the reason um, you showed those two off first is they're they're all made on the lathe, and they're probably just the first to be produced, which makes sense. And they're dropping yeah. compatible with the existing ecosystem that uses V6. Yeah, the the the, the I mean, you know, like... I fucking hate Groove Mount just as much as anyone else. Like, <laughs> I, don't get me wrong here. Like, and we, we ballsed up Groove Mount really hard, like twice, I think, by accident. We're really sorry about that. It's like we changed the Groove Mount standard twice by accident without even really noticing it. Uh, yeah, I, that whole shit it has just a mess. And it yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's still there. We gave you Revo Micro with the nice M12 threads. Please shut up about well. it. I like. I regret it. I'm sorry. We'll never do it again. <laughs> Just let it go. <laughs> and like, we've all dealt with it. Like, we've put that behind us now. Like, can we just move on in this relationship and forget about the whole Groove Mount affair? Okay. Like, just, okay. So yep. expect rigid mounts uh, really, to be announced at some point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the M12 one is nice because you don't have to just come along and do any like drilling and stuff. And so you can make a lot of those heat sinks really quickly. And we're gonna have to make a lot of heat sinks really quickly. And also, it's actually a bit harder than it might sound. Um, okay. 
Yeah, because now you're going back into using doing operations that aren't just lathe work anymore, for the most part. For depending on the, yeah, yeah. the amount you're going after. Yeah, and also just making it work in a Creality type system. Um, the airflow and th- you know it's all designed around cooling a PTFE line yeah. hot end, which just doesn't really care very much about being warm and toasty, or like does any of the air actually hit the heat sink in the current? Like, yeah, there, there's intricacies there. Um, we've got getting those ironed out. Like, we're getting there. We're okay. getting there. Um, the main challenge, though, like eyes on the prize. Um, if we get the whole Revo internal manufacturing process, and this is like incredibly complex, um, this is the hard problem to solve. And then once we're producing these at scale, at a cadence of a thousand per day, going off and designing a new heatsink is is child's play. Um, I bet even the Rob Boron community could design themselves a heatsink. Um, yeah, we probably could. <laughs> Uh, just aluminum. Um, I just, uh, but <laughs> I we're just concentrating our efforts on building um, the really fundamental, critical core technology of the system, and then going out and adapting it and getting it into other machines is is a is an easier problem that we know is tractable. Um, so those are not the problems that you attack first. You know, we're famous for hot ends um, and, you know, the filament drive systems, as we call them, or extruders. As they, it's a very confusing naming structure that we've evolved over the years. But it, in the round, um, I would say that our fundamental purpose is to, you know, understand the underlying physics and operating mechanics of extrusion systems and 3D printers and then resolve that to practice um, by manufacturing and building extrusion systems. And our optimization target is impact. Um, so we're not trying to produce the highest performance extrusion system. We're trying to produce the extrusion system that has maximum impact for human progress, I guess. Um, so that's why we often target things like cost and user experience. Um, over some raw performance numbers. Um, and that's kind of our strategy going forward, optimize for impact. We started out with the vision of producing an ecosystem um, that solves many of the hangups um, and limitations in the V6 ecosystem. Um, so right from the start, in terms of performance numbers, um, the spec was better than or equal to V6. So our starting first assumption is that we don't need to improve performance much beyond V6. Um, Which is true. Like Everyone loves those speed benchy videos now where people are doing benchies in under five right. minutes, but the vast majority of people are printing nowhere near those speeds. It, precisely. And, and this is the vast majority. And so in terms of how do we optimize for impact and have the greatest impact, um, Revo is faster. It prints a bit faster. And is. that is intentional. And we've made it faster to the extent that most FDM motion systems have gotten faster. But we, there's no point making it three times faster when the motion systems in, you know, 95 percentile of 3D printers are, you know, going 1.5 to two times as fast. This is just not really, that's not going to help anyone. How um, long has v7 revo been in development because it, it's v6, a very slip, slippery question yeah. because it was like it evolved and evolved and it kind of hoovered up technologies that were around and it was kind of this snowball of just like how are we gonna do this and that and we made a couple of like big design um pivots early on um how long has it been going on? It's a blurry line, but it's not less than two and not more than four years, I'd say. It's around the two and a bit-ish mark, I'd okay. say. Um, so that's it for the heater. Did you want to talk about the quick change system itself? Yeah. 
the nozzle changing system is different to most others out there in the